So this is going to be the first example from chapter 9, where all of the examples that we're going to do will be statics problems. So each one that has its own video is going to be a statics problem, which means objects are in static equilibrium. And we have the two conditions that we talked about in the um, lecture, so, uh, lecture video, that uh, the forces have to all add up to be zero, so the net force is zero, and the torques all have to add up to be zero. So everything that is trying to rotate the system clockwise equals out all of the stuff that's trying to rotate the system counterclockwise. So over the course of these examples, we're going to see how that plays out. And we will see a progression of starting with simple examples that have their own videos up to working through much tougher problems that will still use the same overall process. So it's worth taking note of the steps that we do here in example A and comparing it to the um, steps that we do in example G um, several videos from now. They will be the same process. And it's worth noting, too, that in these first couple of examples, the process is going to seem totally unnecessary, like there's so much setup when you could have maybe done some of this in your head. And what I need us to understand is we are practicing this process with a smaller problem now so that we can work our way up to the bigger problem. You don't go to a bench press and start out with this huge amount of weight. You start out with just a little bit so that you get used to how that... Um, machine actually works. Same idea here. So what we will think about doing in these statics problems is basically drawing three different pictures because setting the problem up and making sure we understand it is the majority of the effort here in the same kind of way that that was true in some of these um, recent chapters as well. The more effort we put into the setup, understanding what's going on, the easier it will be to know why we're putting numbers in the places that we're putting numbers. So the very first example, or the very first rather, the very first picture that we'll draw is simply a kind of real picture situation. That we want to make sure we know that there are objects here. This one we're told is 25 newtons. As a reminder from previous chapters, newtons is a force unit, so that is weight. It is not mass, and we shouldn't multiply by 9.8. We also have this other object that is 40 newtons, and again, that's weight already, it's not mass. All I'm doing so far is drawing the picture on our slide, and so that's why I'm drawing it kind of small, because we already have it in our slide. We're told that this distance here is 0 0.3 meters, and that this one here is our unknown. Okay, so the next thing that is useful for us to draw is a free body diagram. If we're thinking about forces, we're thinking about a force diagram. So I'm going to write FBD for free body diagram. It's a force diagram where it's of the stick. It's all of the forces that are at, acting on that beam or stick or seesaw, whatever we want to think about it. So we can think about all of the possible forces here. There's going to be a force from this object pushing down on the stick. And so that force is a force of gravity, but we already know that it's 25 newtons. And there's going to be a force of gravity from this other block pushing down on the stick. And so that's going to be 40 newtons. And if we look at anything else that's in contact with the stick, we also see that there's this upward force from the um, support, from the fulcrum, from the center point. We can absolutely think of that as a normal force. It is a, um, a block pushing up on the other. But one of the easier ways for us to think of that is just um, F1, because when we have two supports, we'll call it F1 and F2. So it's support number one here, because a lot of our problems are going to have multiple supports. You can think of it like a normal force, but if we look, it's kind of a single point, and that's not really um, so much a normal force anymore if it's a single point of contact. Not a big deal. It's really just what do we want to call this force. Okay. We'll notice that for the forces, the other thing that we have to think about is the weight of the stick itself. 
in these first, I think, just two problems, in these first two examples that we're going to see in chapter 9, we're not going to worry about that particular force from the mass of the stick because we want to make sure we um, don't have too much going on in these problems. But that is something that you'll be paying attention to in the future. It will just be a third downward arrow, and that will be okay. All right, so now is when we get to the new picture from chapter um, from chapter 9 here. So we're going to draw a torque diagram. And it is really useful for us to think through the steps that we're going to do. So I'll say all of the steps, and it might even be worth making a little list in your notes of what the steps are in words that we're doing when we draw this torque diagram. So the very first thing we do is we draw the, the beam. In a lot of our early examples, it is going to be a horizontal beam. We will eventually see some examples where it's a ladder or a um, angled bar or something like that, and we will have to draw it angled. But for this case, the stick or seesaw that we're looking at is just a horizontal line. So step one is to draw the line representing the stick or beam or bar, whatever we want to call it. The next thing we need to do, and this is extremely important, right away we need to draw where our axis is going to be. We need to know where we're deciding that rotation is going to act around. With this first example that has only one support, that is a very straightforward and somewhat obvious choice for our axis because if we think about the way a real seesaw would work, it would actually rotate around that central point. So that's our axis. I'm not always going to write the word axis, but I will always draw a little star to represent it. Now for the torque diagram, the thing that makes it a little bit different than the real picture is we are just including the stuff that is important to describing torque. So we want to draw the forces, kind of like we did in the force diagram, but in the place where it's actually happening. So for this 25 Newton block, we draw an arrow down, we just write the force in here, and we write that the distance to the axis is this unknown distance. So I'm going to write R axis. And then we have that this 40 Newton weight is acting over here. The arrow is down, and we kind of double check that with our um, free body diagram, force diagram here. And the distance for that one is 0 0.3, 0 0.3 meters. You'll notice that right now these two look very similar. As we go through further examples, we will start to better understand why the torque diagram is useful to have it be separate so that you don't have too much information all in one big, massive, messy drawing. The last important thing for the torque diagram, and I'm even going to put it in red so that we can more easily notice it. So let's, let's go back a step. Um, we'll list what we did so far. So the first thing we did was we drew the stick. The second thing we did was we chose our axis. The third thing we did, and we kind of did it with number four too, the third thing we did was draw all of the forces that are acting away from the axis. One thing to note, this um, F1 here is at the axis, and so we shouldn't even put it in our torque diagram. It is not able to cause a torque. If we think about the idea, the fact that torque is the perpendicular force, times the distance to the axis. If it's acting at the axis, any force acting at zero distance away from the axis cannot cause a torque. So we don't even put it into our torque diagram. OK, so draw the stick, draw the axis, draw the forces. Step four is to draw the distances relative to the axis. There will be other pictures that we see in our slides and in our assignments that our pictures may be showing distances relative to the end of the stick or distances between two objects. And we need to make sure in this step four to only have those distances be relative to the axis. And then step five, which we're about to do in red on our drawing, is indicate clockwise 
CW for clockwise, or counterclockwise for the torque. So here's the axis here. If we think about this force going around the axis, around the axis is a curvy arrow like this, that is a force that is trying to get the whole system to rotate counterclockwise. If we think about a clock, we're going backwards through the numbers. So this is counterclockwise. If we compare to the axis, this force is not just down. If we need it to try to circle around the axis, it's going to rotate like that, and that would count like a clock does. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And we would call that clockwise. So those steps of drawing the torque diagram make it so that when we actually write down our, um, our tools here, We've got everything we need to plug the correct numbers into the correct spots right away. So the tool that we're using down here is the condition for equilibrium, torques clockwise equal torques counterclockwise. So we look, and in this initial example, we only have one uh, torque clockwise. Torque is force times distance. We have 40 newtons of force times 0 0.3 meters of distance. And when we look at our counterclockwise torques, there is only one here. It is 25 newtons of force times our unknown R axis. And what we see is that the math in these problems, especially the early problems, the math in these early problems is actually not where the complexity lies. The complexity is in making sure that we understand what's going on in the system. And the very best way to understand what's going on in the system is to draw a lot of diagrams to help us think through these concepts. Because if we're trying to solve for our axis, what we see here is the only step of math that we have to do is to divide both sides by 25 and then plug that into our calculator. So we have 40 times 0.3 divided by 25, and we get 0 0.48. So our 0 0.48 meters is our distance away from the axis. Okay. That's all that this example asked for. The one thing I will note is that a lot of our examples will also ask for the forces at the supports. For this problem, that wouldn't have actually required us to do anything with torque, because if we look back at our forces and this idea that the net force has to equal zero, that's the other requirement for um, torque, then we would see that this F1, the force pushing up, has to balance the 25 newtons and the 40 newtons, and so that F1 would be 65 newtons, 25 plus 40. So that wasn't an interesting question to ask about, but we will see that example show up in future, um, in future example problems. So uh, we will continue to do these same kind of things. Notice the flow of the problem. We make sure we know what the real si system looks like. Often it is useful to redraw it, even if that example is given to you. It is useful to make sure we know what forces are acting before we get overloaded with the extra information of distances. So just drawing the force diagram is going to help us make sure we keep, uh, keep track of what's here. And then the torque diagram has these steps that we will follow each time. Draw the stick, draw the axis, draw the forces in the correct spots, label the distances, and label clockwise versus counterclockwise. And that helps us know how to put in numbers into this equation. So we will continue to see examples, and I will see you in the next one.